I learned at that point time that one of the hardest jobs I have as president of the Lake Forest Preservation Foundation is introducing Professor Sims. And, and the reason for that is because every time I do, I feel like a chronic underachiever. Oh. Like, just, just to, I, I, we're not going to have time to go through all his credentials, but I'm going to hit the highlights here. But just so you know, uh, Professor Sems, he uh, is the, received his Master's of Architecture from Columbia University and was a practicing architect for over 30 years in Washington, D.C., New York, and San Francisco. He joined the Notre Dame faculty in 2005 and is currently Professor of Architecture and Director of the Duda Center for Preservation, Resilience, and Sustainability. Professor Sems also served as Academic Director of the Rome Studies Program from 2008 to 2011, and continues to divide his time between the Notre Dame campus and the Rome Global Gateway. And I'm happy to report Professor Sems has not resigned from Notre Dame following the loss to NIU this weekend. So he's still there, he hasn't resigned, which is a good thing. He is the author of The Future of the Past, A Conservation Ethic for Architecture, Urbanism, and Historic Preservation, which is a seminal work in the area, and The Architecture of the Classical Interior, his numerous articles, and I won't go through them all, but have appeared in the New Criterion, National Trust Forum Journal, American Arts Quarterly, and Traditional Building, among other publications. Um, he is a member of the U.S. Uh, ICOMOS, uh, the Society of Architectural Historians, and the National Trust for Historic Preservation Leadership Forum is on the editorial committees of Change Over Time, Opus, and Palladio. He is particularly interested, as you know, in the recovery of the classical language of architecture and his current research in this area focuses on the issue of defining appropriate new architecture in historic settings. And today he's here to talk about his new book, which is entitled The New Building and Old Cities, Writing by Gustavo Giovannoni on Architectural and Urban Conservation. Uh, Giovannoni was a central figure in the fields of architecture, urbanism, and historic preservation in the first half of the 20th century in his native Italy and throughout Europe. His theory and practice have had profound influence in these fields up to the present day. And to tell us about that is Professor Sams. Thank you all for coming. It's really a great pleasure to be back with you. I was here about this time last year, and so we can consider tonight's lecture part two. What I'd like to do is actually share with you the pleasure of discovery. When you meet a person, maybe an artist, an author, or anyone who reveals a lucid intelligence that casts new and welcome light on a subject that perhaps you've been thinking about for a long time, but had never really organized into a co coherent system or framework. Uh, maybe this person has attained a viewpoint that encompasses multiple disciplines and ties together many disparate threads. I've been lucky enough to know several teachers and colleagues who seem to have done this. This is how I felt upon discovering Gustavo Giovannoni, soon after arriving in Rome to teach for the University of Notre Dame in 2007. An Italian colleague introduced me to the traditionalist architects of the period between the First and the Second World Wars, among whom Giovannoni was the outstanding figure in Italy. I began to look carefully at their designs, both built and proposed, and gradually, as my study of Italian language uh, skills improved, their writings. But all, immediately the question arose, why have I never heard of these architects before? I thought of myself as well informed about important architects in Europe and the United States in their 20th century, including the Italian rationalists whose geometrical and sculptural abstractions dominated the history books. But who were these other architects who chose to continue the classical and medieval traditions in Italian architecture? I learned there were dozens of architects who resisted the siren song of the modernism and continued to find new things to say in the old languages. They were, in fact, the majority of practicing architects in the 20s and 30s, and their unofficial leader and principal spokesman in Italy was Gustavo Giovannoni a talented architect, as well as a master of all of the allied disciplines. The more I found out about him, I realized that many ideas we take for granted today are in fact owed to him. I found a copy of his most important book, which translated as Old Cities and New Building from 1931 in an antique bookshop in Rome and started reading. What he had to say resonated. His writings anticipated the revival of traditional architecture and urbanism, the growing importance of conservation, and most urgently, the need for uh, buildings that are resilient and sustainable over the long term. 
Nearly a century ago, he had a lot of things figured out. Many of his insights, especially in urban design and heritage conservation, have entered the mainstream of architectural and preservation thinking, but hardly anyone today can identify their source. Again, the question was, why have we not heard of him while his traditionalist contemporaries in Britain and the United States are celebrated? I'm thinking of Sir Edwin Lutyens, Auguste Perret, Paul Cray, John Russell Pope, and Bernard Maybach, to name just a few of his contemporaries that are very well known. The short answer is that after the Second World War in France, Italy, and Germany especially, those architects who resisted the advance of the modern movement were suppressed and disappeared from the architectural histories of the 20th century. In the 1990s, Italian scholars began to look with greater impartiality at those who had been neglected, and a richer and more complex picture began to emerge. There has been an ongoing recovery of the reputations of many architects, and Giovannoni among them, who had fallen outside the standard historical accounts. My own research is indebted to those Italian efforts, and this new book, the first ever in English about Giovannoni, uh, is based on their work, and I acknowledge that. Uh, I and my two co-editors are trying to reverse the neglect that this work has suffered by providing a more complete portrait of Giovannoni and the architectural thought during and after his time, as well as suggesting ways his work can inform ours today. His professional and academic ideal was the architetto integrale, or the complete architect, one prepared to practice architecture, urban design, and restoration, and teach them to the following generations. Giovannoni himself fulfilled this description, producing skillful designs for new buildings, new additions and infill buildings in historic places, master plans for both historic urban centers and new towns, restorations of historic structures, scores of studies in architectural history across all periods, and founding the School of Architecture at the University of Rome, where he taught for a half century and trained many of the following generation of very noted Italian architects. Uh, can you imagine the CV of this man? <laughs> After his death in 1947, his work was disregarded and his name suppressed in architectural circles for what were deemed political reasons. His detractors claimed that he had collaborated with the fascist regime, a claim that, while strictly true, could also be made of almost all of his critics as well. Architects and university professors were, for the most part, aligned with the regime until the mid-1930s, and designers of all stylistic persuasions cultivated the favor of Mussolini until the fall of the regime in 1943, Politics was not the decisive factor because everyone shared that problem. If you understand from the history, everyone was involved. A more accurate motivation, here we go. A more accurate motivation for the neglect was because Giovannoni had been a vocal opponent of the modern movement in architecture. For those who saw the rationalist school of design in Italy as representing progress and democracy, which is kind of contradiction in terms. The defense or continuation of historic cities and buildings represented what they viewed as a sympathy with the aims of fascism and a falsification of history. This is the phrase that you still hear today, that to, to repeat uh, something that is connected to the architecture of the past creates a falsification of history. But Giovannoni's opposition to the Bauhaus and Le Corbusier and the other modernists was not about ideology or style. Rather, he saw modernist urbanism as an existential threat to the historic cities that he loved and to their conservation and expansion. Now, this was no idle concern, as we can see in uh, Le Corbusier's attitude toward the center of Paris, as shown in his Plan Voisin of 1925. Giovannoni was particularly worried about the influence of Le Corbusier on the young Italian architects he taught Fascist minister Giuseppe Bottai had, in fact, invited Le Corbusier to Rome to develop a master plan for the city, though this never got off the ground. We can dodge that bullet. Now, almost a century later, we can evaluate Giovannoni's thought and practice with m more impartiality. Or at least we should, because he has a lot of important things to tell us that are directly relevant 
to our present challenges. Our work on this book builds on the work of Italian scholars and places Giovannoni in a larger international context. In addition to a series of interpretive essays, it includes 30 excerpts from his writings on a range of subjects from throughout his half-century career. The book is organized into six parts around six themes and bearing the Italian terms used by Giovannoni in his discussions. And I'd like to just go through these six themes because that's really the way the book is organized and if you happen to see the book, you'll understand how it's put together. And the first of these themes is edilizia, which in Italian refers to the activity of building as well as its main product, the ordinary construction, mostly houses, that makes up the private realm of our historic cities. Giovannoni drew the important distinction between monuments and fabric. These are terms that we architects use a lot today, that a historic city like Rome or London or any place that you might be familiar with has both monumental buildings, cathedrals, town halls, courthouses, things of that kind, and sort of the ordinary buildings, mostly houses, that actually line the streets of the town and are the bulk of the construction there and tend to be the thing that surrounds the plazas and the piazze and, and so forth and create the urban space. Having drawn that distinction, he pointed out that the monuments derive their meaning from the fabric, not the other way around, which is why preserving the surroundings of our landmarks is so important. Credited as the inventor of the concept of urban heritage, he declared that an entire city could be considered a monument. He introduced this idea into the 1931 Athens Charter on Restoration, the first international agreement in that field, and from there the idea spread across Europe and the US. That same year, 1931, saw the publication of his book that I mentioned, Old Cities and New Buildings, and perhaps not coincidentally, 1931 saw the first historic district in the United States in Charleston, South Carolina. This shift of attention and preservation from individual landmarks, sort of the model being Mount Vernon, okay, George Washington's house, landmark, restore it, you know, uh, but shifting away from the idea of individual buildings to really looking at an entire town or entire city or landscape as something that is deserving of preservation was an innovation uh, that uh, Giovannoni, if he wasn't the exclusive uh, origin of that sentiment, certainly did a great deal to uh, promote the idea internationally. This shift of intention from individual landmark buildings to urban quarters, whole towns and landscapes, was part of a consistent urban focus in Giovannoni's thought. No historic building could be considered simply as a lone freestanding monument without recognizing its relationship to the city or landscape that surrounds it and lends it meaning even if that setting had changed over the years or centuries, however long we might be talking about. Another aspect of edilizia was a focus on the more informal kinds of building one finds in historic cities among the fabric buildings, the non-monuments, let's say. He used the Italian uh, phrase architettura minore, or minor architecture, but we generally uh, refer to it as vernacular architecture. While Giovannoni admired the great monumental achievements of historic architects, he also valued the anonymous construction that following traditional patterns provided a coherent setting in which the whole is more important than its parts. It was this which he called a collective work of art that provided the context within which the individual monuments could be understood. He directed much of his energy to opposing the demolition of the medieval quarters of Rome that was being pushed by the regime. Here is one of many times, in fact, the irony of his political problem is that he, in fact, pushed back on the policies of the regime, especially their tendency to want to tear down whole medieval neighborhoods in order to make enormous open spaces around Roman, uh, you know, the ruins of Roman temples and so forth. Uh, this uh, demolition of medieval quarters in Rome and elsewhere for the sake of creating out of scale and inappropriate large open spaces around monumental buildings, a tendency that originated in 19th century Paris, 
For example, creating a huge plaza in front of the Cathedral Notre Dame, the so-called Parvis. Uh, any of you who've been to Paris uh, in the last century uh, know that there's this enormous uh, square in front of it, which never existed, of course, historically before the 19th century. The, the map on the right, you can see uh, uh, Notre Dame sort of there in the upper right-hand corner, the, the big arches there. And then there was no big square in front of it. There were narrow streets and houses all huddled around the cathedral. Giovannoni argued for the preservation of the pedestrian-scaled, variegated neighborhoods within which the larger monuments traditionally were embedded, composing a picturesque urban scene, as, is, as in his beloved Rome. Today, we recognize not only the highly significant individual buildings, but what we call contributing buildings in historic districts and conservation areas. And I think that thinking very much comes out of this tradition. The second term or part in the book is called ambientismo, from the Italian ambiente, like our English ambient. It means it's the word in Italian basically for environment. So it's close to what we call contextualism, referring to the physical context of any historic site. But ambientismo is something more. We translate it in the book as respect for the setting. For Giovannoni, the historic city was a living organism. And he coined the term ambientismo to denote an attitude of respect for the city as it has developed through time, accumulating layers of history and character and creating a reciprocal relationship between architecture and urban design. Additions to buildings or new urban neighborhoods, he wrote, must approach the historic city with modesty and respect, seeking continuity of character rather than visual disruption. In his view, the modern movement imposed conspicuous contrast between new and old architecture. Giovannoni, on the other hand, called for continuity, recognizing that old buildings are more than just documents of the past, which is another phrase that you hear a lot nowadays. Old buildings shape the city as a whole and contribute to the cultural identity of the citizens. Ambientismo is more than the contextualism of the 1970s and 80s, when I was in school, in which designers made abstract references to neighboring buildings. You know, a famous case was Philip Johnson designed an apartment building on Fifth Avenue across the street from the Metropolitan Museum. And there were two neighboring buildings, both classical, and both had moldings, you know, horizontal lines on the facade, like under the window sills and at the tops of the windows and the corners and so on. But they were at, in two different registers, let's say. They didn't align. So his building is between them. So he ran uh, horizontal lines across, connecting all of the other lines, right? And this was hailed as an example of contextualism. He was making his building fit in, literally, you know, sort of as a content continuation of the two other buildings. Well, that's not what Giovanni is talking about here. He's talking about something a little bit deeper. It entails a profound respect for the genius loci, the spirit of the place, including not only physical, but also the social and cultural character. Ambientismo calls the designer to set aside motives related to ego or desire to stand out and consider any new work in terms of its effect on the character of the city as a whole. In the field of conservation, the priority must lie with the maintenance of the site's cultural significance which Giovannoni viewed as vulnerable to loss due to inappropriate alien additions, no less than to outright demolition. Designing a new building or adding new quarters to an existing city requires a deep understanding and respect for the unique qualities of the place and its character-defining elements. A comment by the historian of American landscape, J.B. Jackson, I think captures perfectly what Giovannoni had in mind by his concept of ambientismo. Jackson said, quote, in order to change a place, you must first love it. Because if you don't love it and you try to change it, you will only ruin it. I think that's really something to remember. That's what jo uh, Giovannoni is talking about here. Now, out of these concerns come the third term, which is diradamento. Diradamento is the heart of Giovannoni's urban conservation theory as it involves both the preservation of historic structures and the curation of public spaces. 
His term, diradamento, one of many botanical metaphors he uses, is derived from the pruning and thinning out of an orchard or a forest. Diradamento is what you do when you clear the underbrush or you go into the vineyard and you get the things that aren't supposed to be growing with the vines and you get them out of there. Carefully tending the, the orchard, for example, removing invasive growth, trimming the branches to let in the sun, and so forth. Such stewardship and care of an urban quarter stands in contrast to the wholesale clearance of a Baron Hausmann or Le Cubusier in their plans for Paris, or post-war urban renewal in the United States, where everything was just leveled and you start over again. Giovanoni seeks to maintain the city in conformance with what he called the permanent causes that shape it, such as geography, climate, ways of life, local materials, and traditional construction methods, freeing the city from overbuilding or overcrowding, and promoting public life in public spaces. He does this by making incremental changes, removing non-conforming structures, opening up a view or a little piazza, allowing the district to breathe, while changing and adding very little. Diradamento is a character-conserving process that avoids both an uncritical preservation that would prevent all change and a permissive development that would significantly alter the historic character of the place. His theory was first implemented in plans for the quarter around the ancient Roman street Via dei Coronari, and in the plan on the left, you can see the very straight horizontal street there that's, uh, you know it's a Roman street because it's straight. <laughs> the streets in Rome that are dead straight, they're probably Roman, ancient Roman streets. And what you'll see there, if you look very carefully, is there are some dotted lines that show buildings that he suggested should be removed in order to create new piazze and new gathering places for the people in the neighborhood. And this was carried out, and it's an absolutely lovely part of Rome. Next time you're there, stroll down the Via dei Coronari and wander off into the side streets, and you'll see exactly what he did, this sort of surgical correction of overcrowding to make everything work better, but without radical change. A decade later, one of his followers, a former student, realized a redevelopment of the Salicotto district in Siena on the right, producing a mix of old buildings and new ones designed to be stylistically and typologically similar, but in a more salubrious neighborhood. What's really lovely is that if you see this neighborhood on the hill from down below in the, in the market square of Siena, you look up on the hill and it looks just like the rest of Siena, except that half the buildings in that part were built in the 1920s and 30s, and of course all the other buildings are like, what, 13th century? <laughs> And it's quite an accomplishment to make a neighborhood that people here you see a playground. Uh, this is a neighborhood people want to be in. And the building there on the immediate left, the old stone building you see there, is probably uh, many centuries old. But some of the buildings on the right are 20th century. So it's an interesting uh, example of how you can actually do this. It's not, uh, it's not impossible. After the war, there were very few instances of diradamento. The conservation of the center of Bologna, Italy, is one, uh, which you see, can see a drawing of on the left. The whole point of that conservation plan was to leave the buildings standing, to clean them, to restore them, to rehab them. This was one of the first times when an entire historic center of a city was under a kind of renovation and rehabilitation plan. It's what, in the following decades, became sort of something that happened all over the world. I mean. Every city, uh, Chicago, for example, many neighborhoods were, were rehabilitated in this period uh, with the idea of bringing the city back as sort of a habitable place. On the other hand, um, there was still a lot of interest in sort of not bothering to rehabilitate existing buildings. Oh, it's cheaper just to tear them down and build new. So there's a kind of tension throughout that period. The planner, uh, the irony too, is the plan on the left there for Bologna was clearly inspired by Giovanoni's theory, but when I interviewed the man who was the chief planner, uh, Pierluigi Cervellotti, I went to see him and I said, so this owes something to Giovanoni, doesn't it? He goes, absolutely not. This is not a diradamento. And I said, oh? <laughs> he said, we didn't tear down any buildings. And then I found out later that actually there were like three or four buildings in the neighborhood that uh, 
that are not there anymore. But anyway, Italian politics, you see. And then on the right, what you see is sort of what happened more often in the post-war period. This is the uh, infamous pruitt Igo public housing near St. Louis that was all demolished because it was such a failure, both architecturally and socially and culturally. And, and the struggle against so-called urban renewal was led, as we all know, by uh, a hero uh, of mine, certainly, and perhaps of yours also, the writer and activist Jane Jacobs, who was one of the leaders of the efforts to look at alternatives. And she uh, promoted the idea of rehabilitation as opposed to demolition. Restauro, or restoration, is essentially the care for architectural heritage in order to render historic monuments and cities as whole as possible to the extent supported by documentation or evidence. Giovanoni developed a comprehensive theory of restoration, proposing treatments ranging from pure conservation, where you do almost nothing but maybe clean and maintain, to major rebuilding with new material. He sought a middle way ranging uh, between the uh, pure conservation approach of John Ruskin and the stylistic restoration of Eugène Emmanuel villers le duc In the 19th century, these were the two poles in restoration. The English school led by Ruskin and Morris, and they're still in business, because if you join the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, or SPAB, you have to sign the manifesto of William Morris, which uh, sort of has their whole philosophy of restoration. How you, you, If you add anything to a historic building, it has to be clearly unrelated to the uh, stylistically and so on to the original building. And it's quite interesting, uh, as opposed to the French school, which had uh, perhaps a very permissive attitude toward restoration. And there are a lot of buildings in France that um, uh, scholars argue about. Uh, uh, Pierre Font, for example, which Ville Le Duc himself restored for Napoleon III uh, is like a fantasy of, of a medieval castle, but how much of it is historically accurate is still subject to some debate. But the, the, the two schools of thought basically are the tension that Giovanoni tried to steer a middle course uh, between them. He identified the early 19th century restoration of the Arch of Titus in the Roman Forum, shown here uh, by Giuseppe Valadier as a model for restoration that makes the monument whole, but also avoids confusing the historic parts with the restoration itself. The architect added elements to complete the missing parts, but the new forms appear simplified and in a slightly different material, Roman travertine rather than marble. The new moldings do not have carved ornament, and the columns are without fluting. At first glance, one sees the entire arch, on second glance, one sees the distinction between the original and restored material. The difference is subtle, but clear. Giovanoni promoted this approach, which decades later would find its way into the Secretary of the Interior's Standards for Restoration here in the United States. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Giovanoni further believed that when choosing a preservation treatment for a specific site, there can be no fixed rules to be applied in uncritically. Rather, judgments need to be made on a case-by-case -case basis. The restorer must recognize, for example, the different approaches called for by archaeological sites that belong to a culture that no longer exists. For example, a building like the, the temple in Paestum here, built by the Greeks in the 5th century BC, is a marvelous landmark, and it certainly should be very well cared for, but we probably wouldn't be in favor of turning it into a, uh, I don't know, a, a theater or a church or something like that now, it, because its value as an archaeological monument is, is what people want to, uh, want to preserve. Its, its status as a, as a ruin, effectively, is part of its, its uh, character at the present time. Giovanoni, referring to these kinds of uh, sites, he referred to them as dead monuments because there's no new life living in them. There's no community that's taking care of them and, and uh, restoring them. And places that continue to house public and private life today, like this extremely lively street, the Via dei Tribunali in Na Naples, which is one of my favorite streets in the world. It is like all of humanity seems to be in this street, you know, either on a Vespa or honking at you from a Fiat. <laughs> 
it's a, a remarkable place and it's very much alive. And so, of course, Giovannoni referred to these as living monuments. And actually, the, the terms were, were uh, originated by a French theorist. They weren't his own, but he sort of popularized them. And uh, uh, later on, these terms were frowned upon because it was a distinction that uh, uh, later people uh, were less interested in having. Now, in dead monuments, he thought there should be no attempt at reconstruction or completion because the culture that made and sustained the site is gone. In the second case of living monuments, Preservation seeks to conserve not only the physical structures, but also the life and purpose that animates the place. For this reason, criteria for alterations and additions in such a case might be more lenient than they would be for an archaeological site, because these are people's homes and businesses that we're talking about. You can't just sort of take a you know, sort of museum approach to the place where people live, or at least they tend not to like it if you try to do that. Now, Giovannoni was rigorously scientific in his prescriptions, often referring to his methodology as scientific restoration. But this did not prevent him from allowing aesthetic judgment to inform the restoration process. And beauty, or as he liked to put it, the sense of art, was always a preeminent value. Later critics would reject arguments based on aesthetics, taking refuge instead in appearing as objective as possible. But this approach has pitfalls of its own and has sometimes led to visually dissonant results. If you actually pretend that beauty doesn't matter, you tend to make things that are not beautiful. It's interesting how that works. After the Second World War, restoration of many Italian monuments, damaged or destroyed by fighting or bombardment, proceeded according to Giovannoni's ideas, as stated in his Italian Charter of Restoration of 1932. But this approach was superseded in the 1960s by that of a theorist named Cesare Brandi, a figure closer to the modern movement and still today regarded as the most important theorist of the modern Italian school of restoration. Despite Brandi's importance in the conservation field in both artworks and architecture, Giovannoni's approach continues to be an important reference and many of his views are enshrined in official pronouncements by Icomos, UNESCO, the United Nations, and other international bodies, though the source of these ideas, again, almost often, uh, uh, often remains unacknowledged. One essential battleground remains that of managing how new added elements and materials should be identified or differentiated from the old in restoration work. Brandi's ideas gave impetus to an approach that prioritizes the difference between the new and the old, largely by means of a modernist expression in juxtaposition to historic forms. You can see on the right Marco Dezzi Bardeschi's avant-garde staircase to the Renaissance Palazzo della Ragione in Milano. His idea being, well, but the Venice Charter and lots of other documents say that we have to differentiate anything that we add to a historic monument so nobody would mistake our new staircase for something from the 16th century. Somehow or other, I don't think that's likely to happen, but nonetheless, that was the thinking. Uh, the battleground then, of course, uh, it continues over this question of what, what would be the appropriate way to add to a historic building. Um, the, uh, the alternative to uh, Brandi's view, which uh, would be uh, basically those who follow Giovannoni's line, is made explicit in a marvelous document from Icomos called the Valletta Principles from 2011, which explic explicitly caution against excessive contrast between new and old construction in the urban setting. Debate continues today between what we may characterize as the heirs of Brandi versus the heirs of Giovannoni in the field of cons conservation. That's an argument that any of you who are professionally involved in this field are very familiar with. The key to Giovannoni's approach on this issue of how do you add new to old is the relationship between new and old architecture in a conservation setting. And this is best expressed by the term innestare. This in Italian is a verb meaning to graft. And Giovannoni, in another striking botanical image, describes an addition to an old house or the extension of a city is like grafting a branch of one tree onto one of another variety to create a hybrid. 
He recognizes the need for change and to introduce new elements into a historic setting, but also prioritizes continuity of character at both the architectural and urban scales with a minimum of contrast. Current conservation norms are often interpreted, not that they're written this way, but they're often interpreted uh, to require such contrast. But Giovannoni offers a dissenting view in which cities grow organically as living organisms. The Valletta principles call for continuity of composition in the urban context when adding new development. And the language of recent UNESCO documents on historic urban landscapes suggests the relevance of Giovannoni's vision as, of grafting as a model for navigating a non-confrontational relation between new and old architecture. I, I like that idea of a non-confrontational approach so that you don't sort of begin with the assumption that, well, whatever we do here is going to be different from whatever we're adding to. Um, one of the important reasons why that doesn't work out very well is a building, if it stands for a long time, will probably have additions more than once. So if the first addition to the building is something very different, what do you do on the second edition, <laughs> and the third, and the fourth? Well, you end up with something you know, completely incoherent. So I think we need to rethink that. Now, Giovannoni himself designed a series of modest but telling additions to buildings in and around Rome in which he demonstrated his idea of grafting. His modest building linking the medieval Casa dei Crescenzi, on, uh, which you see there on the right, does not imitate the original building. That's something important because people say, oh, uh, you mean, you mean you're, you're in favor of just copying. You know, you're just going to imitate, you're going to make the, uh, the addition look the same. No, it doesn't have to be a copy. Decades later, Giovan, uh, Giovannoni's idea that new elements should be identifiable as such while not detracting from one's holistic perception of the historic monument found its way into the Secretary of the Interior standards with its requirement in Article 9 that new work be both differentiated from and compatible with the old. Even if the second adjective was not always getting the same amount of attention as the first adjective, it's very easy to differentiate your work from something else. It's much harder to make something new that is truly compatible with what is already there. Considering that contrast between new and old buildings is a core value of the modern movement, it's not surprising that architects more, are more comfortable differentiating their contributions than they are in making them compatible. Giovannoni argued that only a deep respect, or the love that J.B. Jackson mentioned earlier, for, that respect for the buildings already there can inform a truly compatible addition or alteration. This does not mean copying what is there, but it does involve deep knowledge of the place and its traditions. Giovannoni's approach to conserving historic cities by allowing them to grow and change as they did for most of their history, without direct imitation or the addition of dissonant or alien materials or forms. I find this image of grafting a perfect way to express the quality of care that we must take when adding our contributions to those who came before us. At the urban scale, grafting means that a large city like Rome should expand not by urban, suburban sprawl, but by satellite towns, as he called them, independent urban villages separated by green space and mostly founded upon pre-existing settlements. These walkable, mixed-use neighborhoods would be linked to the city center by efficient trans transit lines, like the English garden cities under development at the same time. Or, for that matter, Lake Forest which originally was a kind of satellite city, right? With the, the rail connection and so on. Giovannoni himself master planned two prototypes for these satellite cities, uh, the Città Giardino Agnene, northeast of Rome, and the Garbatella district to the south. The latter was intended as social housing, which it mostly still is, although it's so beautifully designed and built that rich people keep moving into the public housing. And Andres Duani once described it as social housing that is the envy of the rich. I think that's a, that's a real success story, if you can design public housing that rich people want to move into. Um, unfortunately, uh, the, uh, the area is, as I say, slowly gentrifying. And unfortunately, Giovannoni's advice was not followed 
there were no satellite towns. Uh, in fact, sprawl has overwhelmed the entire uh, outskirts of Rome and nearly every other city in the world. So uh, if we could get interested in this idea once more, we might be able to make something of it. Finally, we arrive at the issue of reconstruction, which has recently become highly contested, with lively debates surrounding recent projects that have rebuilt historic urban areas and buildings destroyed in the Second World War, especially in Germany. Giovannoni supported reconstruction when there is sufficient knowledge of the historic condition to ensure accuracy, and when a community seeks restitution of its monuments in defense of its heritage and identity. Current conservation theory, you might be uh, interested to know, based on Cesare Brandi's writings, is skeptical. I think skeptical is a very light word to use, but it's a polite one. Is skeptical seeking to prevent what it calls uh, the possibility of a mere copy, or worse, a fake. Now, I never understood how you could make a building that's a fake building. <laughs> you know, a fake building, you know, maybe if it's made out of plastic, but a bit, no building is a fake. What these people are referring to, of course, is buildings that imitate historic buildings in such a way that the style of the building isn't the style that you see in the magazines today. But why that should be a bad thing, I've never quite understood. Maybe someone here can help me. Post-war conservation theory has emphasized material authenticity over the appearance of wholeness, though other values, such as original design intent or continuity of use, have also been recognized in recent international pronouncements. Seeking a balance between material authenticity and community values, Giovannoni defended the rebuilding dovera comera, where it was, as it was, of the Campanile of San Marco in Venice, for example, after it collapsed into a pile of rubble in 1902. I don't know, maybe some of you have been to Venice and had no idea you're looking at a 20th century bell tower in the piazza, but it was rebuilt and finally reopened in 1910. And that of the once magnificent Abbey of Monte Cassino after Allied bombardment in 1944. Uh, here also I'll just note the Frauenkirche in Dresden, which I just saw for the first time uh, in June, and it's it and everything going on around it in Dresden and Potsdam and East Berlin. Uh, it's an amazing, um, uh, an amazing uh, amount of work being done. It's truly impressive. In the case of the monastery, little of the structure above the ground floor remained below the rubble but there was enough that the building could be rebuilt more or less as it had been. Giovannoni himself had made some documentary drawings 20 years before the war. In the rebuilding, some improvements were made to secondary areas and an entirely new decorative scheme for the church interior was necessary. More controversially, the architect, Giovannoni's former student, Giuseppe Breccia Fratadocchi, designed a new facade for the church replacing the unfinished masonry of the pre-war condition. Um, you can just sort of make out there's a sort of a very white, as <laughs> the sun on it, facade of the church there toward the, uh, the end of the, uh, the courtyard that you see in the photograph. And that had been just rough stone because like many churches in Italy, the facade had been left unfinished. So as part of the restoration, he designed a facade that would fit the architecture of the classical architecture of the church, so of a, let's say, a calm Baroque uh, style. He also made another change. You can maybe see in the, the, the facade that's looking out toward the, the lower right-hand corner, the facade there, there's a series of arches in the middle. There's sort of a low part of the building and the, an arcade there. Well, uh, before the war, that arcade was a solid wall with one window in the middle. And the architect said, you know, the view is knockout. You're on the top of a mountain. You're looking out over the Valley of the Leary. So he opened up the arcade to match the other arcades that are going around the cloister. These additions were seen as false by critics, but defenders recognized them as a way of completing the monument. Uh, the idea that the historic monument, if left unfinished, it's sort of like it wants to finish the job. It wants to have a facade. It wants to open up the arcade. It wants to you know, have modern bathrooms and so forth. And so 
this idea of completing the monument was something that Giovannoni actually was in favor of. But it's a concept that is inconceivable if one is thinking only of the rupture between the new and the old in architecture. You, it, it's inconceivable that you could actually complete the, uh, the monument. Some preservation authorities, historic England, for example, has, is uh, responding to the interests of communities, is becoming, uh, are becoming more accepting of reconstruction within strict limits, just as Giovannani proposed. For him, the rebuilding of a heavily damaged or destroyed landmark is simply the restitution to the community of its lost heritage, a consideration he thought more important than the conformance of a building's style with its date of construction. In several cases, Giovannoni's support for reconstruction was justified by urban considerations, such as returning a, uh, to a now formless square the missing buildings that once enclosed and completed the shape of the square. His position remains contested by those who continue to prioritize a strong visual distinction between new and old, and for whom any design of new elements that suggest literal continuity with a historical style is viewed as a falsification of history. Giovannoni's viewpoint, however, has been carried forward quietly by such essential documents as the Bura Charter of Icamos, the Nara Declaration, and the Valletta Principles, all of which emphasize conserving the cultural significance of historic places without stylistic biases. And those documents are all available online. If you go on the, the website of ICOMOS, the International Council for Monuments and Sites, and uh, they have all of their documents, there are quite a few of them, uh, but they're interesting reading for those of you who'd like to understand better uh, international thinking on these subjects. Still, this remains one of the most contested subjects in international conservation circles. You may have read about or seen the reconstructed royal palace in Berlin, there on the right, um, a former home of the Prussian emperor and now housing a series of museums. It's now called the, the Humboldt Forum. It's like three or four important museums inside. Three of the exterior facades were rebuilt as they had been before the war, but the interior and a fourth facade were designed by the Italian minimalist architect who won the competition, Franco Stella. Also impressive is the reconstruction of the entire former center of downtown Potsdam near Berlin, where block after block has been rebuilt, not just a building here and there, but just literally street after street after street have been rebuilt, and you see there an example of one of those streets. Now, the most important buildings were reconstructed in their period detail, and the intermediate frontages, the buildings between the corner buildings, are mostly newly designed by a number of different architects, including Stella. They are excellent examples of new designs that harmonize with historic buildings without imitation, and the people of Potsdam are getting their city back. And so the thing that I think is really interesting is this approach of the, the, the sort of um, what is it, the anchors, you know, like the two department stores that anchor the mall, the two buildings on the corners of the block anchor the block, you reconstruct them exactly as they were, the buildings in between, unless they are also, you know, highly regarded monuments, could be redesigned with new buildings of new design, but with traditional materials and uh, maintaining the same continuity of composition as the Valletta principles would have it. Um, the six headings that I've just gone through, I hope, will give you a sense of not only how the book is organized, but how Giovannoni's thought is both comprehensive, coherent, and relevant today. Another area where Giovannoni made a contribution is architectural education. As the founder of the School of Architecture of Rome, he has a lot to say about what subjects architecture students should study and it turns out to closely resemble the pedagogy that we have been using at the University of Notre Dame for the last 35 years ago, uh, or so, uh, long before we knew who Giovannoni was. In addition to the usual courses in technology, drawing, and design, there's a strong emphasis on architectural history. And I think many, many of you probably are aware of our curriculum and its unique way of teaching architects how to draw with their hands, you know, like pencils and brushes, and not just uh, mouses and keyboards. The Master of Science in Historic Preservation program at Notre Dame, too, is modeled on many of the values articulated by Giovannoni, 
about the conservation and restoration of historic places and their importance for new construction that will be more durable, resilient, and sustainable than standard building practice today. This represents a whole new way of thinking about historic preservation. It is not only about saving evidence of the past. It is now also about learning from past experience how to build buildings and cities once again that are beautiful, sustainable, and just. Paraphrasing the French writer Françoise Chouet in her great book, The Invention of the Historic Monument, quote, we restore in order to learn how to build. I love that. We restore in order to learn how to build. This would make an excellent motto for any school of architectural or urban conservation today, or for that matter, any organization that advocates for historic preservation in a town like Lake Forest. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to respond to any questions. Criteria, I was wondering if you could speak about um, the progress or what they're doing in the design of Notre Dame uh, Paris. Yeah. Thank you for that. Did everyone hear the question? The question was, what about the restoration of, the, uh, of Notre Dame in, in Paris? Um, I thank you for that because I think it's tremendously important. After the fire, there was the usual kind of argument, and of course in France these sort of cultural issues are very, they carry more weight maybe than they do with us Americans. Um, and people got quite passionate about, oh, you must rebuild it exactly as it was before, using all the same materials and the same techniques and so on. Um, and other people saying, oh, absolutely not. You know, we have to have a modern response. We have to you know, make a glass roof and put trees and water and fountains on top of the, uh, the Gothic vaults. And somehow or other, we'll get people up and down you know, to it. And we'll make a park up in the air, great views out over Paris. Like I like to say, sort of forgetting for a moment that Notre Dame is actually a church. <laughs> I, I think they just completely forgot the idea. They sort of wanted to turn it into some kind of a fun park or something. I don't know. I think, uh, and, and then of course President Macron got into the act. He said, oh, it's going to be restored. And it's going to be done within five years, so it'll be open for the Olympics and all this sort of. There were all kinds of crazy sort of things imposed on it. What we ended up with, of course, is exactly what Giovanoni would have suggested, which is, Yes, you rebuild the cathedral exactly as it was. Maybe you install a better fire protection system, but you can still have, and, and what's especially wonderful to me about that project, which is now the initial phase is complete and the, the cathedral is open. What is especially wonderful is that all the people who said, oh, we have to build a glass roof, said, you have to do that because nobody knows how to make wood trusses anymore. Oh, there are no oak trees in France big enough to make the beans. Well, as a matter of fact, all of that was completely nonsense. And one of the reasons why it's lucky that the cathedral burned in France and not in, say, the United States is because France has a robust um, historic construction graph, uh, guild system. And so it's absolutely false to say they don't know how to carve stone anymore. In fact, in France, they do. And they do it every day. Hundreds of people are carving stone in France. They know uh, there are timber framers who make the roof structure of Notre Dame, and they could make the roof structure for your house. I mean, you know, the, the medieval crafts are not dead in France, and they're actually subsidized, and it's, it's like a national treasure. Um, and, and some of you may have uh, heard of the Compagnon du Devoir. I'm sorry, I don't speak French. I just try my hardest, and people who also don't speak it think I can, but okay. forgive me. But, but it's, uh, it's an organization that is uh, in continuity with the medieval guild system. I hope that starts to an answer to your question. That's great. So basically, they, they followed suit. Maybe they didn't name uh, the concepts that they were following, but they did conform to what he he would have agreed. And another interesting piece of that is that I mentioned Villers-le-Duc. Villers-le-Duc was the man who restored Notre Dame in the 19th century 
after it had been terribly uh, abused during the revolution. I mean, the statues had all been hacked to pieces and, and horrible things had been done to it. And he restored it and because the, the flesh, the spire, had not survived, he designed one. The flesh that was there, which looked as if it had been designed in the 13th century, was in fact designed by Villa Le Duc in the 1860s, I think. And it's, it's again something that's very hard for um, modern movement type people to get their heads around, that somebody in 1860 could design something that, would, uh, that you would think had been designed in the, in the Middle Ages, because he was so inside of that art form that he could work within it and produce something. So it is that spire that was rebuilt now. Because maybe there aren't very many people like Fiole to do now who could design a new one that would actually fit. Because the ones made of glass that we saw were not, uh, were not really doing the job. Perhaps Mr. Leduc loved the, loved the structure and so he was able to. You bet. He loved it so he was able to change it without ruining it. Yes, sir? Did they upgrade the building? Did they run an electrical system into it? I hope so. Did they have lighting in it? Did they have, you know, uh, I certainly hope so. Um, it's really a little bit of ingenuity is all that's really needed. You can make historic buildings accessible. You can make them survive fires. Um, that cathedral had survived for how many years? Since 1200 or so. More than one fire. Yeah, and I'm sure they have. And, and so I would have to say uh, the, the idea that you cannot upgrade historic buildings, that they're hopeless. You know, we, all we can do is build something new. That's not true. Well, yes? Um, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, there's a wonderful documentary out on I'm proud to say that the University of Notre Dame, note that pronunciation, uh, invited and had the two chief architects of the restoration to our school, and they gave a lecture to our students. And then last year, uh, a whole group of undergraduates, can you imagine undergraduate students in the School of Architecture, were invited to Paris, and the architects showed them all around the restoration, and they've uh, created an article for the student magazine that will be coming out uh, later this year. So, yeah, um, uh, Philippe Villeneuve and Rémy, okay, I can't remember Rémy's last name, but wonderful gentlemen. They had a, we had a wonderful time. Their, their talk had to be translated, unfortunately, because... <laughs> yes. The thing that I recognize when you're talking about Italy is that obviously we have this fabric yes. of uh, ancient cities and we're working with that. We go to some place like Lake Forest and we have a much newer context yes. to work with. Yeah. And I think of, um, but I don't, but as we evolve, it's not like we have to create planned architecture. But what makes me think of is, is college campuses mm -hmm. where, let's say, Northwestern University, we have these beautiful buildings uh, by James Gamble Rogers. Yes. And then we have the library slammed <laughs> in the center of the campus or whatever it is. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. Whereas there's campuses like Miami University in Ohio where they laid out, or Rice University, where they laid out uh, character guidelines. Right. That then, as new buildings are inputted into the campus, they collectively form a, a, a unique yes. form of the whole, right? So in Lake Forest, I think we really have an opportunity to create character guidelines. Then as we start implementing new construction, um, it can fit within the whole. So it, That's it, right. it reminds me very much of your talk. Thank you for that. Um, Yes, Lake Forest may not look a lot like the Italian places I showed, but the principles are ac applicable because Lake Forest also has fabric buildings and monuments, right? Um, Market Square could be considered sort of the monumental core of the town, right? Um, the residential neighborhoods, and I know they're, they're more diverse than people think. I, uh, in my previous visit, I was very impressed to see that there are different neighborhoods in Lake Forest. And so uh, the fabric in a, in, in, in a residential area of Lake Forest, unlike, say, the Italian street where it's all a stone pavement and, and walls of houses, you know, and the street is narrow and winding and so on, uh, 
in Lake Forest, you've got a street that's much wider. You might have sidewalks, you have trees, you have a setback with a front yard, you have maybe a house with a porch or a portico or something, you may have a drive and so on. The elements are going to be different, but the same, the same methodology could be used to understand how does the city, what is the DNA of this city? If you wanted, if Lake Forest wanted to expand and make more of itself, what would be the criteria that you would use to make more of Lake Forest? All of that can be studied and documented, and then on the basis of that documentation, you could make a form-based code. And the form-based code would tell people that you can build this volume, you can build this close to your neighbor, you can build this tall, and you have to sort of respect certain things visible from the public right away. What you do, you know, in the back of your house is up to you, but at least that part of it that's shaping the public realm of the street has to obey some kind of basic principles. You could do this. Uh, other places have done it. Uh, Nantucket has done this. Santa Barbara has done this. Uh, Charleston is doing that. So uh, I, I, I would encourage you to, to work toward that. I think that is going on. I think your, your foundation has, in fact, sponsored some studies along those lines, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should, I should turn to Brian. No, uh, exactly. I was focusing on what the streetscape was going to look like, and our position was you need to not only know the streetscape is going to look like, but what's going to be on the street, because if you don't put what's on the street to be pedestrian friendly, the street's not going to be pedestrian friendly. So we actually adopted and put together a series of principles that basically said, look, what goes on Bank Lane has to be visually compatible with the heritage structures in downtown. So you borrow from them to build right. it. They don't have to be identical, but they, right. build, they, they borrow from them. So we actually propose that to the city and put that in with our proposal on Bank Lane. It has to be both the streetscape and what's on the street. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Just to comment, the Cotswolds um, in the United Kingdom, uh, in England, northwest of, yes. of, of London yes. are um, an extreme version of that because anything that gets built in that region, um, it, it's obviously new, but it's really compatible with the old structures that they actually have a stamp. The UK has a stamp that has a certain uh, set of wool storage shed. Makes it absolutely lovely to visit. What are the places on the planet that people spend millions of dollars every year going to visit? You know, people go to Amsterdam, people go to Rome, people go to Paris, people go to, I don't know, Bali, uh, places around the world, and they tend not to go to places that are bland, right? They go to places that are full of character. Um, and so when people come to Rome, for example, they don't generally take tour buses out into the suburbs of Rome, um, you know, where the, uh, where the McDonald's is, you know. That's really not where tourists are tending to go. So if you ask yourself, what is it that, assuming that the number of tourists who are coming to your city are not overwhelming, that's another problem. Over-tourism is a problem. But if we're talking about a sustainable and manageable tourist activity in your town, you might just ask yourself, what is it these people are coming here for? And what is it that they're going to take home with them, you know, in their, in their memory? Well, the character of the place is really what people take away, right? And you could say, well, um, we, we need to build, you know, some hotels for these people. We need to have, you know, services for these people. We need streets and parking lots and so forth. But then at a certain time, you have to ask yourself, and are we adding these things in such a way that it's going to actually make it harder for the people to see the things they came to see, right? This is sort of the colonial Williamsburg problem, you know. How do you, how do you sort of manage all those people and at the same time maintain the value? And I think, I don't know the cost, I, I know of them, I haven't been there, I don't, I don't know what it's like, but I have read about that, that by insisting that anything you build be sort of like what's already there, you may not, uh, you, you may miss the opportunity to have some incredibly ingenious, innovative architect make something extraordinary, but that's probably not a bad sacrifice to prevent 
the not genius architect from coming in and destroying the whole town, which has happened to some places. There was a question here. Last year, the city had a uh, committee for a strategic plan. Yes. And then there was a survey that was conducted. And the top, I'll give you the top three reasons people wanted to live in Lake Forest. One was police protection. Secondly, fire protection. But third was the architectural, visual character of Lake Forest. So the challenge is to maintain and grow upon that and not let developers come in and capitalize on it for yeah. their own. And, and that's exactly what tends to happen. You know, I'm not speaking specifically Lake Forest, but it's a general problem. It's the old, um, you know, uh, it, it, it's it, what is the phrase about the goose that lays the golden egg, and you, you kill the goose, you know, and then you don't get golden eggs anymore. Is that how it goes? Um, you know, you've got a golden egg here, and you've got a goose. <laughs> you keep that goose going, you know. Uh, any other? Uh, yes, ma'am. Do you have any thoughts about what has happened in London, where Prince or now, now King, King Charles, Charles was very much in favor of preserving the historic aspect of yes. the city, and yet there are some remarkable new things? Yes. London is a very interesting case because um, somebody posted on Facebook not long ago two photographs from the same view from. Greenwich, from the Greenwich Naval Observatory and on the hill, looking back toward the, the, toward the city, toward the center of London across the Thames, right? And in the first one, the skyline of London was dominated by the Dome of St. Paul's. And this was only from about 30 years ago. It wasn't, it wasn't an ancient photograph by any means. It was not that long ago. And then below it was a photograph taken you know, now and you couldn't find the Dome of St. Paul's because there are all these skyscrapers, you know, sort of uh, around it. And I have to say, personally, I think that's too bad. Paris did a better job by sort of isolating all the skyscrapers in La Défense and a couple of other places. Then they opened one on the east side and so on. But then the current mayor of Paris got the very bad idea, well, let's just, uh, instead of making these skyscraper ghettos, let's just let them come in you know, and sort of randomly around, and so they started building. And I think it's really destructive of, of Paris. And it's, again, uh, you're going to have a situation where why would somebody visit Paris if it, they're going to see the same buildings that they could see in Dubai, you know, or Chicago or something. So I think that um, I would, I, I, I'm certainly on, on Prince then King Charles's side. Uh, he was an interesting, um, it was an interesting illustration of the power of the modern architectural establishment. When then Prince Charles made his famous speech, uh, you know, sort of encouraging, you know, criticizing the architectural uh, quality of some of the uh, public buildings that were going up at the time, back in the 1980s. And he was effectively silenced um, and told, you know, you, you're, the, you're the heir to the throne. You're not allowed to, you know, speak on controversial subjects. He says, you know, preserving London as a controversial subject, I, you know, how is that? Uh, and uh, it's, it's extraordinary to think that the heir to the British throne could basically be uh, subject to that kind of, uh, of pressure brought about by the leading architects who were offended by his remarks. But as an architect myself, don't get me wrong, I'm an architect. I've been a licensed architect since 1983, so I can poke fun at my fellow professionals every once in a while. Anything else? Well, thank you so much for coming, and I hope you enjoy the book.